Pedro, I think you're on mute. Maybe unmute yourself and begin again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Giovanna. Well, great way to start. <laughs> um, hello, everyone, and welcome to our session, Let It Flow, a conversation about international data transfers, trust, and governmental access to data. I am Pedro Perez, uh, Director at the Laboratory of Public Policy and Internet, a pen and emerging think tank dedicated to understanding the digital phenomenon based on the capital of Brazil. The session was made in collaboration with CDS IDP, with the collaboration of my colleagues Diego Machado and Isabella Rosel. Diego Machado unfortunately could not be here today, but we are joined by Isabella. I'll pass over to you, Isa, so you can introduce our panelists. Perfect. Thank you, Pedro. It's a pleasure to be here. So I start with the introductions, starting with Pablo Palazzi, who is a partner at LNG and Brea. He's also a professor at the School of Law at, of Universidad de San Andres, focusing on courses in IP law and internet law. Mr. Palazzi is a member of the editorial board of International Data Privacy Law, a member of the International Advisory Board of Privacy International Law, and founder of the Latin America Data Protection Law Review. It's a pleasure to have you here with us, Pablo. Thank you so much. Giovanna Caloni is also here with us. And she is the Global Privacy Manager of Hilton Andrews Curse LLP's Center for Information for Information Policy Leadership, CIPO, where she works supporting projects such as accountability project and helps monitor and analyze legislative and privacy developments around the world with a focus on Europe and Latin America. She also helps manage it manages CIPO's project on Brazilian data protection implementation and effective regulation, a project that I have the pleasure to work with Giovanna. So great to have you here, Giovanna. Thank you so much. Bruno Gencarelli is the deputy to the director for fundamental rights and rule of law and head of unit for international data flows and protection and the, at the European Commission. He was in charge of the commissioner's work in the area of data protection, the decisive years of legislative reform and the EU-US negotiations on transatlantic data flow in the commercial and law enforcement areas. He also led the negotiations on the EU-Japan mutual adequacy arrangement, and he is currently in charge of the adequacy process to respect to the UK and the negotiations with the US on a successor arrangement to the privacy issue. Bruno, we are pleased to have you here with us. Thank you so much. We also have Fernando Mascarenhas, who is a lawyer at Barroso Fonteles, Barcelos Mendoza Advogados. She has a, a LLM at, at the FGV, Sao Paulo Law School. She's a postgraduate student in civil procedure at the Instituto Brasileiro de Ensino, Desenvolvimento e Pesquisa. She has a specialization course in applied digital law and personal data protection offered by FGV Law. She's a former student of the Public Training School of the Brazilian Society of Public Law. Fernanda, it's so nice to have you here. Thank you so much. And we also have Luisa Brandão, who is the founder and the director of the Institute for Research on Internet and Society. She has an a LLM and LLB at the Federal University of Minas Gerais. Luisa is the founder of the study group on Internet Innovation and Intellectual Property. She was also a fellow of the Internet Law Summer School from Geneva University, also for of the ISOC Internet Governance training and the European Summer School on Internet Governance. Lisa, it's a pleasure to have you participate in our dis discussion. Unfortunately, Mr. Fabricio da Mota Alves could not join us today because he was invited to participate in a debate held by the Brazilian Senate. But we are so pleased to have all of our panelists here with us. Thank you so much. And before we start, I'm just going to read a disclaimer. So, uh, the, statement, the statements expressed by Fundação Getúlio Vargas employees and guests who take part in online events and broadcasts exclusively represent their opinions and not necessarily FGB's institutional position. 
We also reiterate that everyone present here spontaneously agreed to participate in this event and to authorize the use of their name, voice and image, besides assigning the copyrights related to their exhibition for this broadcast, which will be available later on FGV's official channels. To continue with this transmission, we ask you to verbally express your agreement with this. Yeah, I, I agree. Thank you. So to begin our panel, I'll pass the floor to Pedro. Thank you, Isa, for this marvelous introduction of our panelists. Um, before we launch the questions, our policy questions for our roundtable, I will provide you with some context for our discussion. Um, as we know, the use of data today is essential for the digital economy that has been evolving. Data has not only allowed innovative business models to emerge, but has also reinvented and had, uh, has had a transformative impact over already established business fields. To harness the potentials of data in our increasingly global digital economy, data protections framework play a uh, seminal role. Although not always necessary, the compatibility between different jurisdictions regulations on data protection is highly positive for our data to flow internationally. Our session will focus on discussing international data flows from a Latin American perspective. Now, we understand that um, discussing this subject for the whole Latin American region might be a very um, ambitious task for such a limited time frame. So our discussion will be focusing mainly on the experience of Brazil and Argentina, and incidentally, also of Uruguay. The choice of these countries is not random. They reflect their experiences with data protection frameworks. Uruguay and Argentina, for example, have been the only so far the uh, so far the only countries in Latin America to have been recognized as adequate according to the European Union data protection standards, which are held as paradigmatic in the field of DP. So, in our conversation today, we intend to cover topics such as the importance of data flows to international trade, effective data transfer mechanisms, and also how the issue of governmental access to data impacts informational flows. To kick off our discussion, um, I'd like to direct this first question to Pablo and Luisa. It's about international trade, and I ask you, how can data transfers be used to unleash more trade and business opportunities not only between Latin American countries, but also among uh, Latin American countries and other international stakeholders. Uh, maybe, uh, Luigi, you can start and then Pablo can go ahead and share his experience uh, from Argentina. Thank you very much, Pedro. Thank you for this opportunity. It's a pleasure to be here with you all and to join this uh, important discussion. Well, um, it's a great responsibility to start this conversation, especially because in the international trade context, uh, we, we witness the importance of a free flow of data. Actually, initiatives such as this one that we, uh, that we, that we live right now is just possible because we have a free flow of data. And so we, we, we could think not just in the trade context, but also in uh, tr technology transfer, the potential of uh, technologies, uh, communications and information. So we have uh, so far evidences of how important it is to have a global system uh, that makes possible uh, a free flow of data through the world and to trade but also for human rights for um, opportunities uh, to enhance equity and fight for example educational and digital gaps so there is um, the first step, I think, it is to recognize the importance for human develop development that uh, free flow of data represents. And when we look to the context, the social and economics uh, context 
of Brazil and uh, our neighbors' countries, uh, especially in the post-pandemic scenario, uh, data flow has um, the potential to uh, fill gaps, uh, especially in, uh, in, in some services uh, and other, other areas um, far beyond uh, international trade. What I want to say is that uh, when we think about international trade, we could, uh, as a society, think it is a very distant reality. But uh, in fact, this is a subject that affects our daily, daily lives and the opportunities we have as a society, and uh, especially for future generations. So um, the services and products that we now uh, are able to consume or to trade uh, is just possible because we have uh, such free schemes of data flow. And so with this first observation that we need to bring uh, data flow and the trade, in the international trade reality to, to our daily necessities and the basic services that uh, communities experience in, uh, uh, in a daily basis. Um, I think I, I start our conversation today and bring this importance, not just in the international field, but also for uh, the develop development area and the human development uh, area. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luisa. Um, and Pablo, if you could go ahead and share your experience from the point of view of Argentina, maybe even uh, uh, do a retrospective. I mean, Argentina has uh, had its adequacy decision recognized by the European Union um, in the first decade of the, the millennium, right? So it's been a, a while. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Pedro. And thanks uh, for the invitation to be here. Um, uh, it's a very difficult topic because it's, uh, we can talk hours about the relationship between international trade and data flows. There are a lot of uh, reports dealing with this, the importance of, of, of business opportunities and, and economic uh, opportunities uh, are closely linked to data flows. Uh, the more economic relationship that a country has with our country means more data flows. So uh, we need to be careful on how we structure those. Uh, in addition, some businesses are more reliant on data, data flows because most businesses are becoming more and more digital. So that's, that's another issue that we have to take into account. And there are a lot of reports explaining the, the relationship between business opportunities, economic impact and data flows. Uh, there are reports from the WTO, OECD, Digital Europe, Brookings Brook Institutions, etc. I, I won't go into all the details because we don't have time, but uh, there's a recent report uh, performed by the London School of Economics with, with uh, Robert Patel, and they explained this was before UK became adequate to the European Union. And before that, they said that if the UK was not adequate, there would be a huge impact on, 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 on the economy of the UK because of the cost of implementation of adopting safeguards, uh, standard contractor clause, etc. So uh, it's so important to be to be adequate and to to be able to allow data flows. And the example can be given with Argentina and Uruguay, both countries, when they they approve data protection laws, they have in mind uh, being countries with adequate legislation in order to foster economic relationship with Europe, specifically with Spain. In the case of Argentina and Uruguay, for example, developing contact centers. And this is written in the legislative history of the data protection law of Uruguay. And, and also, um, uh, you can take a look at DPA reports or statements where they, they state that adequacy for, for purpose of uh, economic development is very important. So uh, I think that's, in sum, to, to conclude, it's, it's very important to to comply with data protection law, but at the same time to allow data flows. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. And thank you, you both for these initial insights about the economic importance of uh, data free flows. Um, it's very clear to see that to harness these economic opportunities 
it is essential that there is a cooperative relationship being fostered between the data importers and exporters. Um, today we have a diverse patchwork of platforms that can allow such cooperation between actors. In recent years, specifically, we have seen, we have watched efforts to advance global cooperation when approaching data flows. The Data Free Flows with Trust, uh, an initiative led by Japan, is an example. Uh, it's called Osaka Track, plans on serving as a roadmap for a multidimensional cooperative architecture for global data governance. Also on the global field, the OACD has also been an important player in advancing broader global principles and standards on data governance. If we bring this, this subject to the regional level, we can see initiatives like the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation um, cross-border privacy rules, which set guiding principles to developing consistent domestic approaches to personal information privacy protections among the countries that integrate the cooperation um, block. So in light of all of this, um, I'd like to direct the two, these two next questions to Fernanda and Bruno. Um, Bruno, uh, speaking from a global point of view, I'd like for you to share with us, what do you find interesting and useful? What 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 uh, gets your attention among such initiatives, and how do you assess the current state of global and regional cooperation for our data governance? Thank you very much. Obrigado. Bom dia, and and thank you very much for for having me uh, for for inviting me. Uh, the European Union is uh, extremely pleased to uh, support uh, uh, this this conference. Um, you, you mentioned a number of initiatives. I think the, the rise of such initiatives, some more uh, uh, promising than others, some more recent than others, some more robust than others. The rise of such initiatives uh, tell us uh, a number of things, probably three main things. First, uh, that this is an increasingly uh, a global conversation. And it's good that it is like that, because uh, if there's an area which is uh, almost by nature a uh, cross-border, which doesn't stop at, at physical border that's uh, 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 data, data processing and, and therefore uh, data flows. Second uh, thing that uh, uh, these, uh, these initiatives, second messages that come out of this initiative is that uh, this is uh, no longer only a, a bilateral conversation between the EU and one country or between two American, Latin American countries uh, or between uh, one Asian country and an American, uh, Amer Latin American country. Uh, there is, in fact, an increasing demand uh, for international standards in this area. And, and therefore, this is increasingly, these issues around data protection, data flows are increasingly on the agenda of international organizations at both global uh, and, and regional level. That development, which is quite recent actually, uh, presents a lot of potential, uh, both for better protecting, a lot of potential, both for better protecting citizens' data when they move around and for making the life of companies uh, active in different jurisdictions easier. Because, of course, if you are dealing amongst regional organizations or within a regional organization, but also between two regional organizations or within a, an international organization, there is, of course, a possible uh, critical mass uh, effect, a network effect that goes uh, much beyond uh, what uh, bilateral dialogue uh, or bilateral arrangements uh, uh, can, achieve, uh, can achieve. And we see this very much in our work. Uh, because we are increasingly working with other regional organizations, uh, networks, uh, etc. And uh, for instance, I'm thinking about the recent work we have done on uh, standard contractual clauses, model clauses. I mentioned that because it's the number one uh, instrument for data transfers uh, in the, from the EU to, to foreign countries, but it's also an instrument which is present in almost all uh, Latin American system. It's an instrument which is present in many Asian or Asian, uh, uh, Asian uh, uh, Pacific system. And we have seen that while we were modernizing our standard contractual clauses, New Zealand was doing its, its, its own, was uh, adopting its, its own standard contractual clauses. Uh, ASEAN, very interesting, 
we would not have thought this a few years ago, the Association of Southeast um, uh, Asia countries, Singapore, Indonesia, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, and others, was also uh, uh, doing its model closes. And what is interesting is that all this work, which of course not doesn't lead to identical an identical output, but it's based increasingly on on, on converging uh, principle. Uh, uh, there is uh, uh, more and more dialogue now uh, between uh, us, for instance, and, and ASEAN uh, uh, to to see how we can bridge our different uh, uh, systems uh, of model closes. This is also very true with um, another form of organization, which is, for instance, coming closer to your region, the. Uh, Ibero American Data Protection Network, which uh, has, I think, adopted uh, very useful uh, modernized standards uh, that um, standards that have that have inspired and are inspiring a number of uh, countries in the region, but which want also to bring uh, a, a cooperation within the region and between Latin America and other regions uh, in the world uh, uh, closer to the ground uh, by developing tangible and concrete uh, tools for cooperation. So we see there uh, a lot of uh, uh, potential. Um, and um, uh, and we see also, of course, another area, another aspect of international cooperation, uh, which is, uh, of course, also very relevant to your region. We see a, a, a system such as the system of Convention 108 and Convention 108 Plus, which uh, is increasingly becoming a an, an universal uh, uh, a convention uh, with also uh, rules on transfers, with also an infrastructure a platform uh, for uh, uh, cooperation between data protection authorities and, as you know, a number of uh, uh, Latin American countries, Argentina, uh, 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 Uruguay, uh, Mexico and others are either members or observers. More will also uh, uh, become uh, accede, I think, in, in, in the coming in, in the coming month, and that's also uh, an, another very interesting uh, uh, place internationally where a lot of things are happening. Also, because that convention is not only a piece of paper; it is a convention that has created a, a, a committee, which is the only uh, uh, standard setting uh, body at uh, uh, international level in the in, in the area of data protection. And for instance, in Europe, we have. Uh, base a lot of our legislation, uh, a large part of our legislation, on standards that have uh, first been developed at the at in the context of Convention 108. And uh, maybe the third message, the third and the last message, uh, uh, I, I of course don't want to be too long, that uh, your this dev the developments to, uh, that you've mentioned uh, indicate is, I think, the very uh, interesting uh, possible complementarity between different instruments, and in particular, the data protection transfer mechanism and trade agreements. In Europe and Latin America, uh, trade agreements and data protection mechanisms are not substitutable uh, to each other. We are talking of human rights or fundamental rights. Neither in Europe nor in Latin America, we, we can negotiate human rights, uh, a compromise on human rights in trade agreements. And that's why in Brussels, Buenos Aires, Brasilia, Mexico City, Bogota, Quito, just to mention a, a few examples, our data protection legislation all provide for specific tools and mechanisms to enable data flows uh, with the necessary safeguards, with the necessary guarantees, also to avoid that a transfer can be used to circumvent domestic uh, requirements. But while those instruments are separate, they can be used in a syn synergetical way. I will give you two examples. First, uh, a data flow arrangement such as an adequacy decision can certainly complement, increase the benefits of a trade agreement. Um, uh, as, as trade is increasingly relying on data transfers. So a, 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 a data flow uh, arrangement such as an adequacy decision or another type of arrangement is, uh, uh, can further facilitate a trade. And that's what we did, for instance, with Japan two years ago. We concluded, if the conditions, of course, are fulfilled, but we concluded in, in that case a, a, a free trade uh, uh, agreement. Before the Mercosur one, it was the biggest free trade agreement the EU had never concluded with a third country. And more or less at the same time, we concluded a mutual adequacy arrangement, which created the biggest area of free and safe data flows in the world. Uh, and. Uh, You've mentioned the UK. Uh, the UK has been mentioned 
uh, of course, the post, uh, the, the, the two adequacy decisions we just adopted with the UK are an essential element of our post-Brexit relationship and are a very important complement to the trade and cooperation agreement we, we concluded with the, with the UK. And of course, there's a lot of potential in the uh, uh, Latin American uh, uh, region uh, because of the network, uh, the network of trade agreements uh, we have uh, with uh, many, uh, if not all, Latin American uh, uh, countries with very few exceptions. I think, of course, of the agreement with Mercosur, agreements that have been negotiated, agreement with Mercosur, the new EU-Mexico association agreement, the so-called Andean trade agreement with uh, 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 Colombia, Peru, uh, and, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and Equator. And uh, there are other trade agreements that are being uh, uh, negotiated with Latin American countries, such as, for instance, the modernization of the trade part of the EU-Chile uh, association agreement. In other words, trade instrument and data protection tools can complement each other. Uh, and uh, 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 you know, in terms of uh, uh, facilitating market success, uh, uh, bringing new business opportunity, while of course, better protecting, better protecting, um, better protecting citizens data. And that's why we are working in reinforcing, uh, we are currently working in reinforcing our existing adequacy decisions with uh, Argentina and Uruguay, and we are negotiating new adequacy arrangement uh, with uh, other uh, Latin American countries. And then let me finish by mentioning very briefly a second uh, example of synergy between data protection and trade agreements. Uh, for us in, in the EU, it is very important to draw a clear dividing line between genuine data protection, which is then dealt with uh, uh, through our uh, rules, the GDPR, or, or uh, data flows arrangement, on the one hand, genuine data protection, and digital protections. We believe that there are a number, number of obstacles to digital trade that have that might sometimes use data protection as a pretext that has nothing to do with data protection. I'm thinking, for instance, about uh, data localization. And that's why in all our trade agreements that we negotiate both at bilateral level and multilateral level, to give it two examples, multilateral level, the e-commerce negotiation in Geneva, bilateral level, the new trade, uh, the, the modernized trade agreement with Chile, to, me, to, to mention an example uh, uh, in the region, we systematically tabling uh, provisions that uh, rule out, prohibit data localization, while of course recognizing the regulatory autonomy of uh, uh, both parties uh, uh, to choose the level of genuine data protection, if I may use that, that uh, uh, formulation, uh, uh, that uh, they, they wish uh, to apply. Uh, I will uh, uh, conclude here, probably been, been too long, but as you can see, this is a, an issue that has multiple dimensions, and I would say that has increasingly uh, uh, multiple uh, dimensions. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno, for this amazing overview. Much food for thought was generated here. We'll leave it for the end of the discussion when we have uh, a proper debate. Um, I'd like to direct this next question to Fernanda. Uh, Bruno just gave us uh, an awesome overview about how the European Union has led, not only bilaterally, but multilaterally, uh, the subject of data free flows. And Fernanda, I'd like to bring the discussion of cooperation to our region specifically. How do you see cooperation being strengthened within Latin America, within our the countries such as Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, would we need, for example, um, first our privacy and guiding principles among countries of the Mercosur, or would it be the case of already advancing uh, digital trade rules among the countries that integrate Mercosur? Um, thank you, Pedro, for addressing this question, um, which I consider to be a very important one. Um, I'm very glad to be part of this panel, and it is a great pleasure to share this experience with you, Pedro and Isabella, and with other panelists here. And considering what you've just mentioned and what Bruno said, uh, I would like uh, first to start by answering what I think about the interesting and useful aspects regarding attempts to set a global governance on the flow of data. Um, the flow uh, of data with trust uh, is quite important for the development of the international trade, but also for the development of the internet in itself. 
And by internet here, I mean digital flows coming from digital service, e-commerce, search, um, communication, intra-company traffic, uploading of documents, and also by giving remote access to a certain database or system. All of these activities can be impacted um, by rules and standards to be set on international data flow. And I believe I would find no opposition here in asserting that global data governance is a goal that must be pursued by heads of governments in, in their daily work. Um, aside from that, at the same time, uh, we cannot forget what has already happened over the years. Uh, looking at the past, uh, there have been valuable experiences that help us to think about the question uh, of the usefulness of those attempts. Um, from this past history, um, I can highlight some obstacles faced by countries in multilateral forums and also when trying to close a deal uh, in multilateral and bilateral agreements. Um, so on the standpoint of multilateral negotiations um, and giving here a, an answer to your first question, uh, for instance, there is the WTOs uh, that has not been able to address the issue so far. And the reasons for it might be the WTO's main goal is the openness of trade and there are doubts pending regarding its capacity to deal with the question under fundamental rights perspective. And the data protection rules are indeed set as a fundamental, as an exception to the international trade discipline. Um, in addition to that, when considering other international organizations, uh, it is understood that these organizations lack a multi-sectoral approach necessary to address the issue in different private sectors of the economy. And here, I mean, for example, the UNESCO, which acts on in education, science and culture, uh, and also the International Telecommunication Union, a specialized organi organization in the telecommunication sector. Uh, these observations are important because, as everyone may know, data regulation crosses over many different sectors, such as financial, health, education, and games, and etc. So now, moving to the plurilateral side, uh, the Council of Europe, in turn, has been dealing with this issue as well. And one year after o OECD's privacy guideline, they came up with the Convention 108, uh, the first legally binding international instrument in the data protection field, uh, which is also open for new signatories, including those countries outside Europe. And here we have in Latin America countries as Uruguay, uh, which has signed the convention in um, uh, which signed the convention in 2013, and Argentina in 2019. Uh, and as for Brazil, it became an observer in 2018. What is interesting to consider here? Uh, is that the convention has received over the years a great deal of influence from European Union regulation. Already in 2001, uh, the convention was amended by its additional protocol in order to implement two new standards originated in European Union regulation. They are, um, first, the obligation to set up a supervisory authority with complete independence, and second, the obligation to implement a framework capable of limiting the transferring of data for non-parties of the convention. In 2018, the convention was modernized, as Bruno said, in order to have a framework closer to and more compatible with GDPR's standards. So although the convention is indicated as an important instrument for achieving global governance among different jurisdictions, it is a closer representation of European Union's view of, on standards for data protection. And specifically talking, about the Japanese and Asia Pacific initiatives, as Pedro mentioned before, uh, they are great case studies uh, because they emerged as an alternative framework led by Europe until then. Um, on the obstacles for bilateral agreements, I think uh, the US and European Union show another important case to be studied. After more than 20 years of history, we are now capable um, of understanding how difficulties may arise even when only two parties uh, try to establish standards for data protection. Although the attempts have now failed with the Schrein's 2 case, what is important here uh, under the perspective of global governance is that the European Commission has indicated once in one of its reports assessing the agreement between US and European Union uh, that their relationship was a matter of great importance uh, because together 
they were capable of establishing a global standard to be considered as an example to other jurisdictions. Therefore, the willingness to set a global data protection rules, which is fundamental for the free flow of data, has been an attempt for many years. And from this experience, researchers have observed that basic common standards is quite difficult to be achieved in multilateral negotiations, but also when we are talking about plurilateral or bilateral agreements. Um, I'm not saying uh, here that it is impossible, but that it takes time, uh, a long time, and huge effort to meet common standards capable of satisfying all of all the parties involved. Therefore, what we can see here is a fragmentation of different regimes in multilateral, plurilateral, and bilateral levels. Usually, under its rules, one does not automatically recognize another as adequate because they evaluate the level of adequacy in different terms. So, uh, to achieve global governance to some extent, we need countries capable of giving up, in a good sense, certain higher or stricter requirements uh, that are well suited for their jurisdictions. Otherwise, uh, the effort, as I said, will be huge and time consuming. Um, now, bringing the question to the multilateral treaty and now answering your last part of the question, uh, among Mercosur countries, this is of course uh, one desirable way out. However, there are some challenges to be overcome here, uh, such as Paraguay ECU has no general data protection legislation in place. The country seems to deal with the question with a sectoral legislation approach and has not yet, a set, up, has not yet set up a supervisory authority on the matter. Uh, additionally, although Brazil, Argentina and Uruguay count with a general legislation on the matter, they still differ in their time of adoption. Argentina has one law dated from 2000, and nowadays discuss a draft bill in the Congress, and Uruguay, in turn, has a law dated from 2008. Both uh, need to update their laws, uh, also in order to keep up with new demands. And on these, Argentina and Uruguay's legislation will also undergo some change uh, to make um, their legislation compatible with the modernized Convention 108, and Uruguay has already signed the convention. Uh, so uh, the, the 108 plus convention. Um, so uh, even inside Mercosur, we have disparities coming from our legislation related to the time of the adoption and also when uh, comparing the content of their rules. Uh, so before we talk about Mercosur and European Commission forthcoming agreement, which I believe would be um, a great result to be achieved, uh, we have to put our house in order first, aim, aiming at harmonizing those rules and also stimulating a favorable environment for closing Mercosur's common standards, in the same sense as the APEC Privacy Framework Initiative uh, has done. Uh, so uh, I apologize uh, uh, for running out of time here, uh, but it's my contribution on the subject. And thank you, Pedro. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Isa. Yeah, and it's really interesting, as put by our panelists, that data protection laws, it's it's a, a way to countries to organize and begin initiatives to organize so they can ha have multilateral agreements and other type of initiatives that allow data flows. But as I said, it's a really difficult and long process so we have to rely on other mechanisms that allow data flow while the countries are still organizing so thinking about these other mechanisms that allow data flows i would like to address this question to louise and to ask her if you think that it would be possible for national authorities to make agreements with global certifiers and not with other authorities or regions and if this would, uh, would if this qualification would allow cross border flows to different regions and how to have this relation with certifiers especially considering that the brazilian authority still hasn't verified any certification so please Lisa, if you could talk a little bit about it 
Thank you, Isa. Uh, I think this adds some some more complex elements to the discussion that my colleagues um, have pointed out. So interesting. Uh, so we we have, uh, I mean, uh, the need to, to to establish cooperation among authorities, uh, as Fernanda just said, there is the need to compromise on some levels from one part to other, and we try to find this common standard first uh, among our uh, neighbors, such as Argentina and Uruguay, then in a regional regional level, and uh, maybe we can go further in transatlantic levels, uh, but there is still a lot uh, of work to do. Uh, considering, for example, that uh, the Brazilian uh, authority for data protection has such a limit uh, staff and a limited uh, independence from from the executive power, it re it really worries me how 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 much the authority can do. I mean, how much is feasible? for us to to wait from the national authority. And this is a point um, where we must stress how important data protection is for a country and how our um, our structure, the institutional structure uh, should uh, be larger than the one we have right now. I mean, we we tend uh, at some point a uh, society to see uh, regulation as a burden, but uh, at the end of the day, there is a need, uh, there are economic bonus to, to be achieved when we have a uh, stronger institutional design, for example, for that data protection. So the point from the Brazilian point of view, I think we, we should pressure for, um, for, for more independence and more staff for our national authority in order to, to be able to work, for example, with certified uh, uh, stakeholders and uh, establish, analyze, uh, well, to, to define these standards. I don't think it is impossible and I think it would be desirable to have this kind of standards because it would make the, the trade operations uh, uh, easier or at least with, uh, less, uh, with less bureaucracy. Um, so it's pretty desirable from our side, but there are um, uh, um, challenges uh, that we must first uh, overcome. And considering this need to, to look better and to, to uh, structure a more robust um, authority for Brazil, um, if we have this, this kind of structure and this kind of uh, opportunity to deal with cooperation, that would be great. First, because we uh, we nowadays already have uh, a very significant trade uh, impact uh, considering the digital economy uh, between our neighbors' countries, between Mercosur agreements or attentives to agreements. Um, so the first, the first thing it comes to my mind when when you ask me about cooperation, it is we need to address it in an institutional way more seriously than we do right now as country. Because uh, by doing so, we could establish these negotiations. We could actually uh, bring to the table different stakeholders that make this uh, agreement feasible. Um, so there is a lot of work to do, and I totally agree with Fernanda that we need to put our houses in order uh, because we we also need to to, to do uh, this internal job of uh, having the possibility to establish this kind of certification and cooperation agreement. 
As, as my colleague has also addressed, uh, cooperation is an increasing need in a global world and the bilateral approach are not necessarily enough anymore. So when we think about um, having an expressive uh, digital trade system, we also need to think about this kind of structures that are needed to establish standards, to establish uh, what stakeholders are certified in order to help uh, business, especially the small ones or the ones that just uh, began to go to, to international trade um, and give them uh, start points, guidelines, or even this, educa this education about uh, data flows and how uh, data transfers must follow certain certain guidelines. Um, therefore, it my answer would be it is very desirable to have this kind of cooperation. It's very desirable that we could um, have uh, different national authorities in the same table to to establish standards and establish uh, at least guidelines for the region. Uh, but from a practical point, I do see some limits uh, regarding um, the, the possibility of the national, the Brazilian national authority to do this job, considering everything it needs to do, and uh, also the very restrict uh, st staff and structure that uh, it has nowadays. I mean, it, we, we can hope, we can always hope that uh, it will be done fastly, but uh, I think we still have a long path uh, in order to establish cooperation, in order to establish uh, such negotiations in the region. Thank you so much, Luisa. It's very interesting when you put the necessity of more staff in our authority and the growth of people capable to working on, on this. And it's very interesting to observe that in different countries, there was a growth in the authorities. So I really hope that we see this also here in Brazil. And this growth was, was stated in a a uh, paper published by Xipo. So thinking about that, I would like to address the next question to Giovanna. Uh, Is, uh, before you address the next question, can I make some comments on what was discussed right now? Because I'm please. really um, really excited. I'm kind of holding myself back here just from please hearing you. Um, I think the key message that everyone agrees is that they data flows are important, they're important for the economy, for individuals, and I think that's um, undisputed. There are two points, though, that I want to uh, bring to the discussion, which is the first one, a couple of times um, it was said that in order to have these kind of global approach, we need to reach some kind of compromise and uh, give up, I think it was Fernando who used this term, give up, but in a good way, certain protection levels. But then we had Bruno saying um, how data protection is connected to fundamental rights and it's not about giving up protections, it's about building on protections. That's the first point that I want to highlight and I will, I'll comment on that. And the second one is uh, the issue of the bilater bilateral approach not working anymore. So just in relation to the first point, um, I think one other way to look at, instead of looking at compromises, I think we need to look at bridging building bridges. And in that sense, I want to bring here just one of the mechanisms as a, an example, certifications, right? We're here giving a lot of focus on adequacy and bilateral agreements on instances where the um, governments of the countries would take proactive approaches to find the solutions to global transfers. But we also have other solutions. And I think, Isa, that's going to start coming into your next question as well. Um, other solutions that are more kind of focused on organizations. Certifications is one of that. A lot of, our, of the data protection regimes in the world see certifications um, as one of the mechanisms to allow data transfers. 
when you build a certification, organizations, so companies, public, private sector, they go and, and certify. And normally this um, involves them having to demonstrate that they have the right processes and policies, procedures, internal controls to protect personal data. And that's accountability um, in, in a nutshell. And when you focus on certifications, you focus on the organizations making these changes internally. So all of this to say that the data flows can be enabled, of course, through governments and reaching bilateral agreements, but also through companies proving to um, certification bodies, certifying or assigning to codes of conducts that they also have the right protection in place and they can be trusted uh, with the data when the data comes to them and they can be trusted that they're going to uh, have the right protection in place. So that's my first point. My second point is in relation to um, the bilateral approach, not working anymore or not being enough anymore. And now we need to seek a global um, approach to data flows. I completely agree that we need to seek a global approach to data flows because data is global anyway. Everything that we do now, most of the things is digital. And I think that's undisputed as well. However, bilateral agreements also have um, their function and are also important to specific scenarios. I'm seeing this now in the UK and I'm based in the UK, I live in London. And um, I also see this as a potential for Brazil. And we, in many conversations that we have with the UK at CIPL, um, with the GCMS, we see them looking now at bilateral agreements um, and, and even adequacy decisions with a more strategic uh, kind of view. And we know that as well when our, um, most of our data protection laws were inspired in the GDPR and the GDPR, of course, like written recently, but kind of following with a regime that was in place for 20 years already, um, came up with adequacy as this mechanism that's almost attached to trade. And we see now from Bruno's um, statement today how data protection is more related to trade and being more considered related to trade. So bilateral agreements could also be seen in a strategic way of countries like the UK who are are trying to kind of understand where is the trade more relevant? What are the countries that we need to focus on? And bilateral agreements can be an instrument to enable data flows between these strategic countries from a trade perspective. So um, just wanted to make these two points and happy to continue these discussions. Um, I know that we have some time for the sessions, but now is a, a feel free to uh, go back with your question as well. Yeah, just thinking about this conversation and uh, Taking the moment that we are talking about this, I would just like to pass on the word to Bruno, who had something to say about our, your comments, and then we move on. Please, Bruno. Yeah, Bruno. yeah very briefly, because I understand that uh, uh, we need to move on. Uh, very briefly, when I said that uh, we are in an area which is uh, marked by its uh, human rights, fundamental right di dimension, which is, by the way, something which but brings together Europe and Latin America in terms of like-minded partners, also in light of our recent or less recent history. Uh, I, and that data protection cannot be negotiated, traded in the same way as uh, you negotiate uh, uh, custom duties or, 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 or tariff or non-tariff barriers. That doesn't mean that we need all to have the same identical level of protection. I think that and here we see a lot of potential. There's an increasing convergence around the world and in particular between the EU and Latin America. And we should build on our commonalities. Or each of our system is different, uh, reflects some societal choice, some, some different legal traditions, but we are working here on, on basic communities and, and, and looking at commonalities and looking at our system, taking them in their totality, their globality and see whether they they, they uh, provide a similar level of protection. Second thing, um, I don't think that this is about choosing bilateral versus uh, multilateral. I, mean, I totally agree with what Giovanna uh, just said, that you, know, you need to have a broad transfer toolbox. And we are not only working on adequacy, as I said, I mean, our number one tool, transfer tool, is standard contractual clauses. And we have made them more modern also to allow many companies to use them uh, around uh, many, uh, uh, co processing chains that are increasingly uh, complex. We should work on all the elements 
of the uh, 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 transfer uh, uh, tool, uh, or transfer toolbox. And again, I think there's a lot of commonality between Europe and Latin America in that area. We, we find this, the same broad categories of of uh, of, of transfer mechanism. Uh, some that are more based on an adequacy approach and others that are more private law instruments, such as contracts, codes of conduct and certification. Certification is can be an interesting thing, but is an, a, a tool which is quite expensive. We have seen it in practice. And uh, uh, when we are thinking about providing all stakeholders, including small and medium uh, enterprises, with uh, useful uh, transfer mechanisms, we, we need provide, probably also to, to, to think about other tools. And then third, my third and very brief point uh, in reaction to the previous intervention, I understand the challenges that are uh, exist in Latin America, but I would be a bit more optimistic, if I may, as, as, as a foreign observer. I think Latin America, and when I'm talking about Latin America, in the broader sense, uh, South America, Central America, the Caribbean area is is one, if not the most interesting laboratory uh, in terms of data protection right now in the world, because there have been a lot of new and modernized laws that really tend uh, uh, to be based on on common principles, as reflect as reflected, for instance, in the uh, Ibero-American uh, standards. Uh, in terms of similar tra of transfer tools, we see a lot of similarity, and there's even an infrastructure for cooperation. I understand, I understand that the Ibero-American network uh, is really trying to move, to transform itself uh, to a real uh, a network of data protection authorities that will work on convergence and cooperation on the ground, including in co uh, uh, with respect to cooperation, uh, enforcement cooperation on the individual cases, development of guidance. That's also something where we see a lot of common ground with what we are trying to do in Europe. To the European, to the European Data Protection Board, which brings together our data protection authorities, and we would like to encourage European data protection authorities and Latin American data protection authorities to work more together, as they are very often uh, facing similar similar issues. Thank you, Bruno, and I will give the floor to Giovanna to also respond to these provocations and answers. But just thinking about these tools that we are talking about that are more private, private tools uh, and thinking about the similarities between Latin American laws and the European law, such as the code of conduct being a tool to use uh, for data flow internationally. But we have some differences as well, uh, like we have a procedure set by the European law to have a, a verified code of conduct that we don't have here in Brazil. So thinking about all these different tools that we don't need to have the the actions taken, we don't need any actions taken by an authority and are more civil. Uh, can you, Giovanna, walk us through a little bit of the, the challenges of using these this instruments and also how can we be, be certain that these instruments will be reliable to have our data transfers internationally. And please also feel free to use your time to answer Bruno, please. Yeah, of course. Uh, I completely agree with everything that Bruno said. And, um, and I think we're really on the same page. We really support, Bruno, what the um, you're doing the European Commission of exploring all of these um, tools and mechanisms. And as you said, we always say um, that data protection and, and, and data transfers mechanisms are a toolbox. And as we say as well with the legal base for processing, uh, we tend to say that there is no hierarchy. And I'm just bringing this up because I know that a lot of our audience today is from Brazil and, and I know that the issue is still a bit um, early on in Brazil of, of us having our LGPD law recently approved. And I think there is a tendency that people put a lot of, of weight on adequacy decisions, but actually the LGPD followed the GDPR in having this, this toolbox. And the idea is to enable data transfers as much as possible and exploring every and each of these tools as much as possible. And Isa, to your question, um, it's really interesting because the LGPD is innovative. It's quite similar to the, G the GDPR in many ways, but it's also very innovative in many ways. And uh, it brings two um, tools to this toolbox, so mechanisms to transfer 
uh, personal data abroad that you don't find in the LGBT, uh, sorry, in the GDPR, and that relate to uh, the legal base for processing. So the LGPD allows organizations to transfer personal data um, when there is a legal obligation, when it's necessary for a contract, when it's necessary for judicial proceedings, and when there is individual consent. Of course, consent to the standards and validity of the LGPD requirements, which are quite similar to the GDPR. And consent is even a higher standard for transfers because the LGPD asks for organizations to kind of highlight that clause that they're consenting to the transfers, they, it has to be highlighted in the contract. The way I see these um, are that they don't depend on any action whatsoever from the ANPG. Then we have a couple of, um, of mechanisms to transfer data that actually depend on approval and action from the ANPG. And which is the adequacy, of course, same with the European regime, and some of the contractual clauses, because the LGPD says that the ANPD is responsible for developing the content. And we can talk about SSCs later. Um, I think this is going to be in the discussions. SSCs in specific is a really big discussion, especially after SRAMs, which is our big elephant in the room. So these are the two um, mechanisms in the LGPD, and I'm speaking for LGPD, and I apologize uh, for the other countries, but LGPD is a law that I am more familiar with, and we have here Pablo that can speak about Argentina as well. Um, the other transfer mechanisms that are in the LGPD that are kind of in the limbo are um, three groups. The specific contractual clauses, the seal certifications and codes of conduct and binding corporate rules. And here's the interesting thing about the LGPD, which is quite different than GDPR. The LGPD says that the ANPD, the Protection Authority, um, can um, verify these mechanisms. It doesn't say that the NP ANPG has to approve these mechanisms. It says verify. And I think verify is what that needs to be interpreted. And it needs to be inter interpreted as well, having in mind the purpose of the law, which is to enable data flows with trust, responsible data flows, and uh, growth of the economy as well. So the way I see this um, is the LGBT is not prohibiting these uh, transfers based on these mechanisms. The LGBT is not asking companies do not use these mechanisms until the ANPG verifies them. And we need to consider as well that the ANPG is a new data protection regulator. They're still getting set up. Um, they have limitations in resources. They will need time to upskill. And even if they are um, established like the UK ICO with 900 staff members, I don't think reviewing and approving every single transaction uh, abroad and every single specific contractual clauses, certifications codes, BCRs, uh, should be their main priority. I think they have to apply a risk-based approach. So what I'm trying to say here is, in my view, from my interpretation of the LGPD, I think we should see these kind of mechanisms that are in the limbo as mechanisms that can still be used um, right now by organizations. And if it comes to the point where the ANPG approves these mechanisms, then they become even stronger because they have verification and approval. But I think they play a role in enabling, um, enabling cross-border transfers of data. And on top of that as well, in specific seal certifications, codes of conduct, BCRs, they are accountability mechanisms as well. As I was beginning to say in my previous um, previous contribution, they require the organizations to have processes, procedures in place. They require the organizations to demonstrate that these procedures are effective to whoever they're getting certified to. Um, in order to join a code of conduct, they have to provide this, they have to. And also there is a review um, cycle as well in most of these mechanisms. So it is good practice in any case. And I do think there is so much potential in these mechanisms and they have to be used. I think I'll keep to here because I know we're 
almost running out of time. And I think um, looking forward to discussions next as well. Thank you, Thank you. Without further ado, I'll pass the floor to Pablo to talk a little bit about the Argentinian experience with these two books and all of these other mechanisms that an organization can use for the international data transfers. Please, Pablo. Thank you, Sabela. So uh, Argentine, Argentine data protection law has 21 years of existence. So it's a pretty old law in terms of digital digital economy. And, and it's based on the old European directive of 1995 and the Spanish Data Protection Act. So when we approved our law in Argentina 20 years ago, we didn't have in the, in the law a uh, neither binary corporate rules nor standard contractual process. But by the time we started applying the law, the DPA realized that we needed to have those because those are very flexible tools. Uh, so, uh, but it takes time. It took time because uh, only uh, uh, four years ago, the DPA approved a model of standard contractual process, which obviously was based on the European model of standard contractual process. The good advantage of, of looking first and being coming later is that we, we skip all the debate between having SEC for data controllers, SEC for data processors. And um, by the time by the time the DPA has to approve a model in Argentina, we already knew all the problems that were taking place in Europe and we approve a double model, one for transfers to data controllers between data controllers and one for transfers to data controllers to data processors. And and what, what is interesting here is that um, contracts were in, used before to, to establish international data transfers processes because uh, we were using it before and they were contemplated in some way, they were authorized in, 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 in the law. And, and here we're using a very old legal instrument, which is contract, which has been used since Roman law to, to foster data flows. So uh, it, it's amazing how this tool can be used and, and and I understand as Bruno said that you know nearly eighty percent of, of the companies use use data data transfer agreements to to comply with data transfers. Now probably the challenge in Argentina and the rest of Latin America will be how to update these standard contractor clauses because uh, there's not a model that is valid for all Latin America and, and so uh, we need to have a model for Latin America that's very important. Also we need to update update the model in light of the new model that the EU has approved recently and in light of SHRAMS 2. Uh, SHRAMS 2 brought to the table an issue which is that you have to know your transfers. I think that when we talk about uh, standard contractual clauses, there's a risk that the companies will ask, okay, can you give me a model and I will use it and the company will sign it and they will forget, they put it in a drawer and that's it. So the problem with SECs is that you need to be vigilant and you need to know um, the data, the data, data importer country legislation. So you basically need to know your transfers, and you need also to adopt other technological safeguards like encryption or other things. And this is all being developed now, and you can read it in the EDPB report that supplements uh, transfers after Shams two, and and that is coming to Latin America because if you see some of the cases going out at the DPA level in Argentina, the DPA is, is already requesting some companies to show that they are adopting uh, extra safeguards that are not in the in the standard contractual process itself. So uh, as, as we tend to, 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 to do legal transplants from Europe to Latin America, uh, we, we, we started to incorporate that. Um, and, and as an instrument of private law, standard contractor clauses, I think they are great to foster data protection. What maybe we need to see in the future after they are adopted widely in Latin America is to see more police work from the DPAs on going an extra mile and not just checking that the company has a SEC in place, but checking how transfers are taking place, what safeguards are adopted, etc. So, and this is kind of the effect of strength to in Latin America. Um, and second, we talk about binding corporate rules. Again, these binding corporate rules were not implemented in Argentina in the law that was approved 21 years ago because at that time, BCRs were not developed even in Europe. They come after by, by introduction by the Dutch and the English who were pushing for a more flexible approach to data transfer. 
At first, there was some resistance, but finally, the working party adopted some legal instruments and, and VCRs were deployed in, in Europe widely. Uh, the only disadvantage probably is that they are very expensive for companies because it takes a lot of work. But, but there are some very flexible instruments. Argentina regulated VCR after Uruguay did it. Um, Uruguay was the first country to have it in the laws. We don't have them in our laws. We have them in a supplementary decision issued by the DPA. And so far, only one DPA, uh, sorry, so far, only one binding corporate rule has been approved in Argentina for one company. Um, the problem that I see for, with VCR in Latin America is the following. Usually, I haven't seen any global Latin American company to implement VCR and seek adoption in the rest of DPAs because basically only Argentina, Uruguay, and Brazil have, uh, approve them. And uh, But what I've seen is that when they come to get it approved in Latin America, they will come with a VCR that was already approved in Europe. Uh, so most of the work is already done by Europe. You have a, a leading authority that approve it, and then uh, that's done, and you can change it. So when, when it comes to the DPF Argentina reviewing that, if we want to change something, we cannot because you can't touch the VCR. It's already approved and working. So one issue that has to do there is that we, sometimes the DPA will ask you to, to create a supplementary affidavit or rider to the VCR to, to complement it because we have public policy rules and jurisdiction rules in Argentina. You have to subject to the jurisdiction of the DPA in Argentina. And the, and the VCRs that are seeking approval in Argentina or Uruguay, they are drafted for Europe. So we cannot approve in Argentina or Uruguay a legal text that mentions GDPR or the Directive of 1995, which doesn't it's not valid law in, in those countries. Uh, and also, apart from that, there's a question of uh, whether um, other branches in Latin America can adhere or subscribe the VCR if their local DPAs do not approve them because they don't have a procedure yet to approve them. So whether that will work as a legal transfer for mechanism. So that, that this comes to the issue that we need to develop in Latin America a global scheme to approve VCRs because uh, the way they are working currently is very difficult. And that legal scheme should come from the Red River Americana Protection of Datos, which is the, the normal forum to, to deal with these issues because it's the regional gathering of the DPAs. Uh, and the same, I would say, from SECs. So uh, that's it. Thank you, and I hope I know, it's clear. Okay, thank you, uh, Pablo. Um, as we're far ahead of time, this uh, has impacted our organization for the rest of the questions. So I'll make some adaptation here and I, I beg you to bear with me. Um, this next question I'd like to direct to Fernanda just before we open to the public questions, to the audience questions. And in light of uh, the Schwem's two decision, Fernanda, and what Pablo and Giovanna have shared, I'd like you to, and taking in consideration that on the regulatory agenda of the uh, ANPD, international data transfers are to be um, regulated in the first semester of 2022. I'd like you to analyze what can we do until there? What's strategic for uh, private stakeholders mainly um, to um, conduct until uh, the further regulation comes from the ANPD? Um, uh, great, uh, thank you, Pedro. Um, just to first add a brief comment on this. Um, I think um, um, just bringing uh, the experience of European Union here, um, the validation of privacy sh uh, shield trends too can uh, be felt here in Latin American uh, companies, uh, in Latin American uh, countries. And why, um, why I think that um, is because we need to um, use this experience, uh, the trans experience, to contribute uh, to an awareness raising Latin American countries. Um, mainly when it comes to discuss governmental access to data and to attempt to engage CEOs and staffs in the private sector. Uh, sometimes when uh, we are carrying out compliance programs here uh, in Brazil, it is common, um, although uh, the relevance of LGPD is gradually increasing, um, uh, to face uh, some, uh, some difficulties in engaging all of the staff on the matter. 
So we usually need to continuously um, bring their attention to the topic by saying, uh, this is an important issue. Can we have a little of, of your time here? And when it comes to the trains ruling, at least in Latin America, it helped us to shed, to shed light on the importance of the implementation of data protection safeguards uh, to uh, be dealing with governmental authorities or when transferring data outside. And I think that it is a question to be, um, to be put in the table when discussing IMPD um, uh, point of view in this discussion. Um, in addition, um, also, I think that um, international experience also uh, help us um, to spread the relevance of LGPD uh, into our internal uh, programs compliance. Um, and what I think it is important here um, and now from the perspective of the companies is that uh, we need to understand that it's worthy uh, to establish good relationships with our data, with their data subjects. Companies must establish a good relationship with data subjects, regardless uh, of they are. And because individual, individuals are gradually increasing their capacity to evaluate if these activities um, is carried out by companies um, or is violating their interests and rights, being capable uh, now individuals and supervisory authorities with their capacity are now being capable of shaking many steady structures built so far and developed so far uh, for companies and market. So our supervisory authorities uh, now need to understand that they are entering into an international debate and in with in, uh, supervisory authorities in European Union are making efforts to investigate the compliance and adequacy of the activities of these international activities. And our uh, ANPD is also entering in this, uh, in this scenario. And I think when we are discussing STCs, when we are discussing adequacy decisions, we are discussing BCR's, BCR's codes inside Brazil, we need to understand this, that uh, we have already uh, more than 20 uh, past history coming from um, European Union, and we are now putting us in this international debate and how we as a, as a country and then as a Mercosur uh, regional initiative can contribute to, uh, to our point of view. Um, I don't know if I, <laughs> I answer directly your question, but uh, um, this is one of, one of things that I would like to share. And uh, also because um, Giovanna and Bruno said before, when I say giving up, uh, I know it's, uh, it's strange to say this word when we are talking about uh, data, data protection and fundamental rights is not my main point here uh, to mean giving up, but also that uh, Mercosur as a country need first uh, to, um, to put uh, some uh, common standards in the ground. We need to understand where we are. And, and, and because of that, I am saying that we need to put our house for, uh, first in order and then empower our, ourselves when we are talking about international trade and mainly when we are talking with countries uh, who has more than 20 and 30 years of history implementing their higher strength, their higher standards on the matter. And also when they are regulating uh, international data transfer as well. Thank you, thank you, Fernanda, for all of your considerations. And yes, you, you answered the question. Um, uh, we're moving now towards the end of the panel. Unfortunately, we have a very limited time frame, and I'd like to uh, get a question from the audience. Uh, first question is directed to Mr. Giancarelli. Um, the person asks if the trade agreement between uh, the European Union and Mercosur already covers provisions related to data protection. So. Yes. Um, as oh, I said, and if I may, uh, I'm sorry yeah. Bruno, for interrupting. Yeah, go if ahead, go ahead, please. Very concise. We appreciate because we're on our final ten minutes. Thank you. So, I mean, the 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 the, 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 the EU Mercosur agreement, which is in part what we call the trade agreement, and in part a, a more political agreement, identifies data protection as a, as, as as an area of cooperation. Um, and, and, and stresses the importance of promoting and protecting the fundamental rights to privacy and, and data protection. 
as a central uh, factor of consumer trust in the digital economy and an essential element for further developing commercial exchanges and law enforcement cooperation. So that's one of, I would say, one of the core values on which our strengthened relationship between Mercosur and the EU is based. And on that basis also the agreement uh, uh, calls for a closer cooperation uh, uh, between our, uh, uh, for instance, our data protection authorities. But as I said, our trade agreements uh, uh, are not a substitute to uh, a specific transfer mechanisms. Uh, we have, as it has said, as it has been said, already two adequacy decisions with Mercosur countries, uh, Argentina and Uruguay, which are, by the way, also a member uh, uh, to uh, Convention 108. We believe that there is a lot of good perspective and potential uh, uh, for future for current and future cooperation with Brazil. And I think that one day we, we, we can get there also with Brazil. And I hope that the, that day will be sooner than later. Uh, then the fourth, indeed, the fourth uh, 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 member of uh, Mercosur is, is Paraguay, which uh, is a bit, uh, is not yet there in terms of uh, its own domestic infrastructure, but I understand they are a promising uh, uh, development. So I'm sure that both bilaterally and with Mercosur as a regional bloc, uh, we will uh, work uh, uh, even more uh, uh, on these issues uh, in the coming uh, months uh, and years. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. Another question from the audience and directed to Fernanda. Uh, do you believe, Fernanda, that the soon-to-come Chinese uh, personal privacy data protection law is a good step on reaching multilateral data flow agreements with Western countries, in perspective of China? Well, I'm not an expert on China uh, law in regional uh, initiatives, but I think that China is now uh, in increasing in, in, in being inserted in this international debate and will also be seen as a third pillar. Yeah, we have um, a, a perspective coming from United States, one perspective coming from from European Union, and now China uh, is, can be seen by Latin American, and also we have Asia Pacific initiatives with, uh, in Japan, but now we have China positioning itself and being seen here in Brazil, being seen here in Latin America. They are uh, being seen as other alternative models and actually we have also companies entering uh, into our mar market coming from um, chinese based uh, hard quarter hard quarter companies and so uh, i think that for us it is m one more model to be studied and put in place and put in the table when we are discussing what is the model that we want to follow my main point is that it's very important and we are here studying a lot uh, European Union um, model of regulation data protection field, which is which we are now following them uh, in many sense. And I think it's great because our way to treat our way to protect these is, is, a, is under a fundamental right perspective. But I also think that we have to understand what are, what are the other models of regulation on this? And why we are not choosing this one? Why we are following European Union and not uh, uh, not following all the others that we have uh, on the table? That's only my main uh, point is because when we are discussing uh, global data governance and when we are discussing how, uh, uh, how uh, what is our next steps, we need to understand all the initiatives in place and now China comes uh, on the table and I think it's very important for us uh, to have researchers and to have uh, inside the, le the legislative place and also in, in uh, ANPD's uh, person, uh, professionals specialized in this uh, in this field also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fernanda. Um, can, can I say something on China very, very quickly? Because I think yes, it's, it, it, it sends a paradoxical message. On the one hand, I think the fact that China feels the need of putting in place, uh, of adopting data protection between inverted comma rules, shows that I mean, its companies, and as we know, they are increasingly important Chinese digital actors, which are uh, 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 we, we, which have customers all around the world, that its digital companies increasingly feel the need 
for indeed uh, increasing trust in the way they collect data, process data, and then feel the, feel the need for some rules in that area. That's one, one sign. The other sign is what we discussed before, is that data protection doesn't come in a vacuum. Data protection is about a fundamental right, is about a human right. And when you don't share uh, those basic values, uh, and here we're talking of a system that comes from a completely different type of regime, which is certainly not one uh, based on, on those values, then uh, I'm, I'm not sure we are speaking about the same thing, uh, because you cannot have uh, a, a, a genuine data protection is in a system that doesn't, uh, which is not grounded on uh, individual rights, uh, uh, access to justice, and independent authority. So that's uh, uh, a, a, a certainly a, a certain tension uh, that we're seeing here. Thank you, Bruno. And adding on that, there's also the the very specific issue of governmental access to data with. With, in the aftermath of Schrems too, we are more than ever paying close attention to it. So uh, I really welcome your considerations about the paradoxical nature that, me, that, that, that this regulation in China may be sending out to the, the, the ecosystem of stakeholders. So we are unfortunately reaching the end of our panel. Uh, much discussion we could be continuing here. But I'd like to thank uh, the participation of Bruno, Luisa, Giovanna, Pablo, and Fernanda, and also my dear colleague, Isabella. Uh, thank you for sharing your uh, amazing uh, point of view, points of views and, and really uh, contributing to such, a, a, such an important topic for the future, uh, not only of data protection and the digital economy, but maybe of the internet as well. Um, uh, getting back something that Fernanda said, how, how data flows are important, not only for trade, but for uh, the internet as well to, to work properly. And um, as a final remark, I'd like to remember, I'd like to recall something that Louisa said in, the, in her speech, how um, data free flows not only contribute to, to trade, but also to human development, to strengthening of, um, of many initiatives in, in a community and a national level and problems. So Isa, uh, do you have any uh, final remarks? Well, I would just like to thank everyone for participating. The panel was amazing. Uh, we have so many topics to discuss still. So thank you again for being here and contributing for this discussion that it's only beginning. Thank you. Congrats to all of us, Bruno. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank any you. Final thank remarks, you. everybody? Thank you. Thank you all.